on Hudson Twin H Power. Here it is. Root torque. Yeah. Fabulous. Another episode of Jay Lono's Garage, the car we're featuring today, 1951 Hudson Hornet. You know, I'm a huge Hudson enthusiast, and thanks to the movie Cars, Hudsons have become very popular again, especially with young kids. When I drive mine down the street, they all go, Doc, Doc, you know, after Doc Hudson, you know, the, the character voiced by Paul Newman in those very popular films. This car is interesting because it's owned by a man named Dave Bonbright. Dave is an automotive historian, and he was one of the people that the filmmakers use to get all the facts correct on the Hudson. He's a real Hudson expert. This is his car. In fact, they were so pleased with the work he did. Paul Newman even signed the uh, visor, which is really kind of cool because Paul Newman did not sign anything. <laughs> I knew Paul Newman. He was a great guy. He just didn't like to sign stuff. It just wasn't his thing. But he signed this, so that shows you the importance of of Dave and uh, this car. Well, let's bring Dave in to talk about the car. Dave, how Great. you doing? Good, how are you doing? Thanks Good for Good to meet a fellow Hudson man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, thanks to you, Hudsons have become hot again, you know? For a while, they were just kind of old cars with six cylinders, and people didn't really appreciate how fast they were and how innovative they were. 1951, they were the, the uh, fastest American production car, and they were also car of the year in 1951. And Hudson was the first company to uh, sponsor uh, stock car racing at that time. That's right. And Hudson's really handled because they have what they call step-down design. As you can see, the chassis it had a recessed floor, which is what, three or four inches lower than the frame? Yep, exactly. Gave it a lower center of gravity, so they handle better. In fact, when you watch old stock car footage, it's kind of cool because you see they might get the Hudson on the straightaway. Maybe a big V8 might take them, but when we get into the corners, the Hudson would, would blow the doors They up. don't have the roll. Right. So they had that low center of gravity, and they had the streamlining because the roof was lower because of the uh, recessed floor pan. Let me shut this door. And it really is aerodynamic, isn't it? It's very streamlined, yeah. It, it looks like a very early Audi TT. You kind know? of, yeah. kind of, it does. I mean, all the, everything old is new again, you know? And, and it's interesting because this is a shape that really holds up the test of time. You look at a lot of cars in the early 50s, and they look awkward and there's too much chrome. Whereas this is such a clean design, their big mistake was they never had a V8. They should have made the V8 in 1954, actually. Right. That was the year that, uh, that uh, Nash took them over in 54, but they should have made a V8 and they should have changed the styling because of the unibody construction. It's more costly to do that. So Ford, Chevy, Chrysler, they could just put another body on their platform and be off and running. So right. they could change their styling every year. But this basic styling was from like 1948. Right, right. So. And of course the twin H meant Two one-barrel carburetors? Two one-barrel carburetors. Ooh. Big deal. This, in 1951, the original engine was 145 horsepower and had a two-barrel carburetor. You could get the twin H in 51 right. at the dealer, and that qualified Hudson to be able to run the twin H in 1951 and win the uh, NASCAR championship, which they won in 1951, 52, 53, and second in 54. Wow. So. Because everybody thinks of the Rocket Oldsmobile 88 as the first hot rod car, but these were actually faster than the they Rocket were. 88. They Th were. This was the fastest production American car. I know, it's funny. And it was just short of 100 miles an hour. The Oldsmobile was like 96 miles an hour, so it was a couple miles an hour faster. You know, it's funny, I've mentioned this before, I've got an old piece of tape, I wish I could find it. It's one of those reels they used to show at the dealerships, you know, to show to customers. And it's silent with you know, the art cards. Mm -hmm. And it shows a guy working on a Oldsmobile V8. And the customer's going like this, and the mechanic's going, but these overhead valves are so hard to adjust, I'll try and get your car running as quickly as I can, <laughs> Mr. Johnson. He's going, well, I've got an appointment. And then they pan over to the Hudson Hornet, and the guy is just 
torquing the head and going like this, and the customer is very pleased. And none of the complication well, of those well, pesky overheads. Well, that's one valves. thing nice about <laughs> a, a six-cylinder. This particular car, you can change the spark plugs in 15 minutes. Yeah, I know. I, and I that old 88, you're going to be there for probably an hour, hour and a half. Yeah. You know, so. well, let's open the hood and show people what we're talking sure. about. Sure, let's do that. Pull it. There you go. Want me to do it? Or you yeah, go ahead. You get on that side, I'll be on this side. There she is. Well, I love the Twin H and the, look how much extra hardware you're carrying with two giant oil bath air cleaners. This is fabulous. It's just such a cool looking thing. But and you know something, when you open the hood of an Oldsmobile or a Cadillac with that big V8, Boy, that was a that was a, that was the selling point. Why why get a six when you get a V8 for the same money? And that's what really really hurt them. But these were just fabulous. See, one thing about Hudson with the, with the inline six over other flatheads, even the Ford uh, V8, is they had the cubic inches. There were 308 cubic inches. Right. And they had extra large intake and exhaust valve and uh, intake and exhaust ports. Right. They had a uh, pretty hot camshaft in them, uh, a little bit of compression in them, and they, uh, like I say, uh, in this configuration, it's 160 horse. And then in 1952, what they did as a dealer option also to qualify them to run uh, a NASCAR, they had what they called the 7X uh, motor. Oh, right. So sure. what the 7X motor was, was bored 20 thousandths over. It even had larger intake and exhaust valves. It was uh, factory relieved. It had a hotter camshaft, dual exhaust, and it was rated at about 210 horse. Wow. See, so where the Oldsmobile was like 145 at that time. So they had a big horsepower advantage in 1952. I remember there was so many accessories available. There was a company named Clifford. Clifford made a lot of stuff. They made the heads, they made all kinds manifolds, of... Manifolds, they yeah. made everything. And uh, the Twin H part of this thing, like I say, in 51 was a dealer option, and it was a whole $85. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that, was a, that was a lot of money. Yeah, I guess so, because gas was, what, 20 cents a gallon? And what did this car sell for new? New, it sold for about uh, 75 cents a pound. Oh, okay. Just like buying hamburger. Right, right. It was uh, between twenty-five and and uh, three thousand dollars. So an eight, eighty-five dollar option. That was yeah. That, that was a lot of money. And it was priced in the range of a uh, Oldsmobile, or uh, Ford. Wise, it would be bet comparable to a uh, Mercury between a Mercury and a Lincoln. Chrysler probably between a Chrysler Windsor and a Chrysler New Yorker. Sure, sure. Yeah, let's shut the hood again. Sure. <laughs> And across that big gun sight on the, <laughs> as, plus a lot of people don't realize these had an interesting braking system. You had hydraulic brakes with a mechanical backup, correct? Yes, they do. So if let's say your fluid ran out, you would have a mechanical brake, which means you had a rod instead of fluid to, to, correct, to stop yeah. you. So it, it was almost like all cars have to have dual systems now, front Today, and back. Right. That was a very primitive but effective, effective dual system. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. they used cork in the clutches, as I remember. Cork clutch, yeah. uh, which has oil in it, and, right. and it uh, the cork the oil expands the cork, keeps it tight on right. the disc, and also keeps it cool. But it, it gave a real nice soft uh, start. Yeah, and these were torquey motors. You Very know, nice. we in America are accustomed to thinking of six cylinders as something less than a V8. But, uh, I mean, there were six cylinders, the, the Jaguar, any number of European ones that were more powerful than V8s. But for some reason, we've just, because of General Motors and the Ford V8, we've come to think of that as the, the ultimate. Whereas this See, was... See, these, these yeah. had a lot of torque because they had a four and a half inch stroke. Yeah. So, you had a lot going on. There were like 275 pounds foot torque. And this one is a three-speed with three overdrive. Three-speed standard. Yeah, yeah. Do you have which overdrive? They, which, which, they, which they did make overdrive. Yeah. And they did uh, come with a hydro, dual-range hydromatic. Most of the Hudson Hornets that were made were four doors. Right. Not coupes. But the coupe is really the best one. For the racing, that's where a lot of them disappeared, you know, yeah, as they got yeah. wrecked and stuff. So. And you had the post here for rigidity? 
Yeah. Yeah, very nice. I, I think it's just such a great looking design. Let's, uh, let's come around to the back of the vehicle so people can get a kind of three quarter view here of what we're talking about. Okay, here we are at the rear of the car. You know, I kept thinking these would have been excellent for the moonshiners and the rum runners because they handled so well. You know, when I, we just did an episode for uh, JLO's Garage for the, the TV show about rum running and stuff, and they would take old Chevys and Fords, but Hudson was really the one. Because you had the handling, right. plus you had the power, right. and with a coupe, you had the big trunk. Right. We'll yeah. take a look at that in a minute. Now, the thing I love about these is if you're going to restore one, engine work, pretty reasonable transmission. Chrome, that's where your money, oh my God, there's so much, look at this, 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 <laughs> this is like five pounds of solid chrome. chrome right there. I mean, these are massive, you know, nowadays everything is plastic. There's Whereas no these, chrome. I, I mean, the, the overriders, everything. Look at just how much detail and chrome there is in this car. And this is totally stock, not custom in any way. Yeah. It has a lot of chrome, yet it's clean, you know? Mm -hmm. When you look at like, a lot of the GM products in 58. They were pretty gaudy. Yeah, just gaudy. Whereas this has a lot of chrome, but for some reason it seems to work. And this emblem is just classic. With the rocket, it's yeah. perfect. Let's show people what a real trunk looks like. Absolutely. That up. There you go. Hold All right, you got a full size spare. No stupid inflator can here with a little rubber donut. I mean, it's really a good sized trunk. You can put all kinds of stuff in here. You can put a lot of booze in there. You can put a lot, can put a lot of booze in there. That's correct. Just great. Cool. Now tell me about the lettering on the side. They called them the, who, who raced with the fabulous Hudson Hornets? The lettering was put on from the, for the Hudson factory, right. but the first uh, person to win the championship in 51 was Marshall Teague. Right. And uh, his chief mechanic was Smokey Eunuch. Wow. Yeah. And uh, there were other drivers, Herb Thomas, uh, Timmy Flock, and whatever, but the factory back cars had the fabulous Hudson Hornet logo right. on them. And a good friend of mine who's deceased now painted all of this uh, lettering on here. And uh, it's not vinyl. It's painted just like it was in 1951. Sure. I, I believe they're the only company to use the word fabulous. It's I think just, you're right. Just a word you don't really hear in NASCAR. No. Fabulous. It just sounds funny. And it but it worked. It, yeah, I know it worked. It really is because it's a fabulous car. Yes. Exactly. And of course, you had the fender skirts. and Right. It's just so aerodynamic. I would always be curious to know what the coefficient of drag is on this car. I don't think they ever wind tunneled one back right. then. Right. But I mean, I bet it would be pretty effective it, it, I, yeah because of the streamlining because of the step down effect you know and they could bring the roof line down which is only five five feet right so. when they raced these did they race with an overdrive yes oh they did okay. yeah so they could get the miles per hour yeah. gotcha gotcha yeah mm -hmm. and the kind of cathedral yeah, tail, tail lights, lights here uh, just, just beautiful that's beautiful. Let's uh, let's show people the interior because I, I love the dashboard of these things. It, it's so Wurlitzer looking. Oh, definitely. Come so. on, let's come around here. Let's take a look at the interior here. Now, obviously, the upholstery has been redone in the original style and the fabric. Exactly. But my favorite thing is, and I'm guessing the dash has not been redone. That's original chrome, everything. Original else. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Even chrome the handbrake handle. I mean, well, you had to. Yeah, it just chromed everything. <clears throat> but it's it's not gaudy. It's not Wurlitzer looking. It just looks classy. It's all functional. And my favorite thing about these cars is, and we'll talk about two when we're driving it. This is pre-power steering, pre-power brake, so everything is nicely weighted. Exactly. You know, you you can feel. It doesn't feel heavy, but. It feels firm, so yeah. you, you always know what the tires are doing. And that's why they had a large steering wheel. Yeah. For the power steering part. See, I, I love yeah. the big wheel. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I just feel like you're seven years old sitting in your dad's lap driving this yeah. thing. And another favorite thing is, look at this here. Let me bring the seat forward. So you have a grab handle here for the person in the back. And then you got these here to put magazines or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you know. Whenever you went to the dealer, they would have like Cosmopolitan and New York. They always have high-end magazines. And one there. thing about this car and a lot of the cars in the 50s, they did have a lot of ashtrays. A lot of ashtrays, right. yeah. yeah these were smoking see. machines. They, they were smoking. Everybody was they smoking. They were smoking hot. Every passenger had an ashtray, which <laughs> yeah. is really, really funny. But 
you know, they did a lavish job on the interiors. I mean, look, they put the fabric in the door. That was their own design. Yeah, and leather. And, oh, oh was this one? I'm trying, because they used to have a, a, it looked like a wood grain dash, yeah. but it was, they would dab it with. It was dye. It's, it's like right here. That's right. all been dyed. Yeah, yeah, dyed, but there's also guys like, that can. You, it's like ink or something. You that dab they do with it. a sponge to yes. make it give a wood grain yeah. look, even though it was metal. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and this was, like you said, in the middle price field. It wasn't the high end. It wasn't the low end. Oldsmobile, Buick, Buick, like, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, Mercury, uh, Lincoln. Yeah, it wasn't a cheap car. Uh, by comparison, uh, say a 1951 Ford Business Coupe was about seventeen hundred dollars right. and this was like twenty five to three thousand depending on what options you got with it and hudson was built in detroit detroit okay. 1909 they started and it was really an offshoot of hudson's department store yes it was it? yeah he was one of the financers of there was four engineers or executives that came from Oldsmobile, and one of the executives was related to hudson and that's how it all began, and he financed the company, so they named it Hudson after the department stores. And explain the derivation of the triangle on the hood. What, 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 what does that symbol mean? That I don't Do know. know. No, I don't know. That's that why. I don't know. <laughs> I I that's one you. thing I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I guess because of World War II and, auto and uh, aircraft influences, everybody had some sort of gun sight hood ornament, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, well, that could very well be it, I, yeah. Yeah, GM had the round look like a like you yeah. firing. That makes sense. Yeah. So, well, very cool. Can we uh, can we take this thing for a ride? Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. Let's hop in. Okay. Hudson's always start right on the button, don't they? Clutch is a little, you know, the cord clutch. No, the clutch is very progressive. It's yeah. very nice. Now, folks might find this interesting. Besides being a Hudson guy, you're a legendary machinist, mechanic, and you, you do a lot of Porsche stuff too, right? Yes, I do. I started working on Volkswagens first and then kind of spun over into the Porsche thing. And uh, today I do a lot of Porsche cylinder heads. And you do some of the historic ones. You did the Grumman Coupe, yeah, the very first... Uh, first Porsche that uh, won Le Mans in 1951. I did the cylinder heads on it. I did the uh, crankcase. I did the, the uh, crankshaft and the connecting rods on and that. You and you told me the crankcase was dated 46? 1946, yeah. I believe that the Porsche didn't start selling cars till 49, but we think that the uh, that he had a, an engine pool, uh, pool and that if they blew an engine up, you know, at a, at a race or something or practice, they just pull one out of another car, stuff it in there and go. They weren't care they didn't care about numbers matching cars then. Right, right. So that particular car th or that engine was dated 1946. So it's one of the oldest engines known that I well, know. Well, just of. the fact that you know to trust you to do the work on it is a testament to your ability that I mean, it doesn't yeah. get much more valuable than the Grumman Coupe. That was the first Porsche to I, win a race. I would have to say that that particular car is priceless. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how you'd put a price on it at all. And if somebody ever did buy it, it probably would be the Porsche factory. Now, let me ask you a question. Now, you started in go-karts, so two-stroke air-cooled, Volkswagen air-cooled, Porsche air-cooled. What brought you to Hudson? It seems like the exact opposite. Well, it's water-cooled, it's a flathead, it's not exotic. I always wanted to build something different because everybody, when I grew up as a kid, they, it was the muscle car right. era, and everybody had a GTO, and everybody had a Corvette, or an old 442, or a 396 Chevelle, or something. And so I thought, well, I just want to build something different, but yet compete with them on the street. Right. So I researched it out, and I found out that Hudson made this big, giant, flathead six, so I thought, 
perfect. So I bought a Hudson Jet, which was their compact car. Right, that was a little, that had a small. That, that had a little 202 cubic inch flathead. Was that a six or a four? It was a, a six cylinder. That was six also, yeah. So I pulled the engine out of it, bought this wrecked Hudson Hornet for a dollar from a friend of mine <laughs> that wrecked it. I pulled the motor out of it, overhauled it, ported it, relieved it, built my own intake manifold, put three carburetors on it, exhaust system. A friend of mine built the, uh, uh, the hydromatic transmission for it. I locked out the rear end. Oh, you're it, running a hydromatic in it? Yes. Wow. It would run low 14s and a quarter mile at, in uh, the high 90s miles per hour, just short of 100. Right. But I'd go street racing with it, and I would race all these these GTOs and, and uh, like say, some Corvettes, stock GTO, not a modified one. Right, right. And I would beat them, and then, then we'd pull over, you know, at the bowling alley or gas station, and they'd go, okay, Dave, I want to see that loaded 327 Chevy you got in that pile of junk you're driving. So I'd lift the hood up and they'd look at the they'd look at the engine and they'd go, what the heck is that? And I'd say it's a it's a Hudson Flathead 6. And they were just totally dumbfounded that a Flathead 6 would would uh, blow the doors off. Blow the doors right, off exactly. of let's say a stock GTO. <laughs> That's very funny. So and it it was uh, not a very good looking car. It was uh, but that's what I wanted. I wanted a sleeper, you know. And that's how I got involved. Now, what with made it. you go with a hydromatic? Because back, the, like, as I remember my muscle car history, the first transmission that could really put power to the ground faster than the stick was the torque flight. Was the torque flight, yeah. right? And the Hemi, the idea that the Hemi, uh, the Hemi torque flight was faster than a manual transmission yeah. seemed unheard of back in the day. So, what made you go hydromatic? Well, my my buddy did automatic transmission and he said okay Dave I'll make you a transmission that we can lock out with a dual range hydro we'll lock we can lock it out in every gear and we'll change the torque converter Understand. that means we can shift it manually right. rather than have it shift automatically right. so it's kind of like a semi auto a semi automatic right. or what semi stick I should say right so anyway uh, so I, I I went with that I said perfect and it worked out perfectly and I had the 410 gear in the back and we didn't have positive traction back then so we made our own by locking the rear end uh, welding the spider gears up and that gave us uh, both wheels driving but it wasn't so great around corners <laughs> yeah, yeah, just... at, at all but uh, it was a great combination for street racing for that quarter mile it's funny It is funny how a movie or a TV show could just make a vehicle hugely popular again. You know? Well, all the kids know everything about the Cars movie. They know more about it than I do. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's amazing. And of course, Paul Newman signing the... That was pretty cool. Now, tell me about that, because I know Paul Newman, and or I knew him, sorry, and he, you know, he didn't like the sign stuff, as I mentioned before. What was the circumstances? Did you kind of quietly approach it how did you how did you get that to happen well we were we were down at uh, the movie makers and uh, and a uh, few of us went down to san jose when he was running the uh, indy cars last indy car race which they won by the way so we were having lunch with him so we thought i thought well let's bring the visor down and, and see if he would autograph it because he wasn't known to autograph anything right and so we took it down there, had lunch with him, and he was more than happy to. Yeah. To so how it. did you approach him? Because you knew he didn't like that kind of stuff. How did you sneak it in the conversation? Well, I, I knew he, he was the voiceover for the movie. Right. So he almost had to. Yeah. So I twisted his arm, and he was, and he did it. So it was great. No, no, he was a very nice man. Super just, nice. Guy. He just didn't believe in autographs. For some good. reason, I never did ask him why, yeah. but uh, he just wasn't. But. Beanie was part of the voice and the character, he was more than happy. Right, and it wasn't like he wasn't a snob or anything like that. No. Nope. He just, for some reason, thought it was stupid, and why would anyone want a signature? You know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but no, he was a very nice man, because a lot of people don't do it because they think they're above the, the person, or, you know, it's beneath them to sign. Right. But that was never the case. No, right? not with him at all. No, wonderful person. It's amazing what a nice driving car these are, you know? They, they are, drive really nice, they are. 
you know, I could drive, I, well, I use my Hudson Hornet a lot. I can't say I use it as my everyday car because it just kind of attracts attention, but they're very smooth. Yeah. They're great in the corners because yeah. of their low center of gravity. Yeah. And uh, they're just, you know, like say they made car of the year in 1951, yeah. so they couldn't have been too bad. Like most cars of the period and this year, when you went around a corner like that, if you were going anything above the speed limit, you just hear the tires, you hear them just start to squeal a little bit Plus because, the, because you roll and they the were- The roll yeah. of the body, exactly. Right, right. Because the, the other cars had their bodies mounted to the frame. Right. And they had the had, had that higher center of gravity. You know? well, these were real good driving cars. I bought my first Hudson back in, I think, 69 or 70, and I paid $400 for it. My father thought that was just was crazy of, money. That was a lot of uh, money. That was a lot of money. Yeah. But, for but, an old car. But it was restored. Oh. You know, okay. it was nicely done and painted. But still, it was an old car, yeah, so that was, was a lot of money. Car. Yeah, yeah. And it got stolen. Oh. It got stolen, and every day I went down to the police impound lot to see if it had turned up. It never did. Oh, no, no. Oh, so did. then what happened was, after about a month of going down every couple of days, a cop pulled me aside. He goes, look, your car's hidden in the back row. One of the guys here wants it for himself and wants to buy it at the sale at the end of the month. He felt so sorry for me. He said, uh, you just go look around and why don't you just come across it by mistake? And then I did. I saw it sitting there. And uh, so that guy really helped me. Anyway, after I got my Hudson back from the impound lot, the guys that had it must have over-revved it or anyway to jump time. You know, the timing chain. Timing chain was off a tooth. And it didn't run. So I put it in my... It was in the fall, and then I went away to school. Then came back in the spring. Well, let me get this thing running. So I got into the dash, and a snake fell down on my face. Oh, nice. Like, ah, ah, ah. Right. That's all good. Okay, that was that. Okay. <laughs> and, and I went away again. Then I came back a couple weeks later. I got into the dash, and it was a beehive. And I got stung all over the And my father said, get rid of that car. Yeah. The car's going to kill you. So it definitely would, yeah. I'm not sure what happened to it. I think I sold it to somebody, pretty much what I paid for it, which amazed my father. Now, do you have a lot of people coming to you looking for Hudson because of the popularity of the movie? Yes, it, it made a big difference in people looking for, for the cars. Yeah, absolutely. This car, came from a gentleman in uh, Arizona, Al Saffron, oh, okay. who had bought this car originally from uh, oh, Bill Albright. Bill Albright, Albright. yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, he, out in Fontana, I think. Yeah, he was the Hudson guy. I used to go yeah. to him for parts all the time. That's where I bought my Hudson jet from that I put. Oh, yeah? The 308 in, yeah. I bought it from Bill. And he was one of those guys that was the guy from the day they went out of business forward. Yes. You know? Yeah. From 50, yeah. 54 on a, actually Hudson went out in 57, Right. but when Nash Kelvinator took them over, everything from 55, 6, and 7 were basically just rebadged Nashes. Right, so right. So they weren't really true Hudson. Yeah, it's like, like Packard, remember the Packard 57, yeah. did the same thing, and Studebaker yeah. and Packard. Yeah. Fabulous! It's funny, I, I, whenever I meet guys that have Hudsons, there doesn't seem to be a big thing about sticking some sort of Chevy V8 in it. You know, people have no compulsion about putting a Chevy V8 in a 32 Ford or a 40 Ford or whatever, whatever it might be. But Hudson guys seem to like to stick to the original powertrain. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a Hornet with a different engine. And I'm sure there's, there's probably very few there, out there. There's very few of them. Yeah. You're right. They like to stick with Hudson. Hudson car, Hudson engine, Hudson drive frame. Yeah, and it's it because it, 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 it is what makes the car. Right. You know the twin H. It sounds so powerful, but it's only it's only two one barrel carburetors. It, yeah. And the carburetor looks like it would go on a Briggs and Stratton lawnmower engine or something. But yeah. Anybody ever run one of these with Webers or anything? I guess. It, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jack Clifford made a lot of the speed equipment. Yeah. He, yeah. he made a high compression head. 
different camshafts and they made an intake manifold that should put three uh, side draft uh, oh, wow. 45 DCOE Weber's on. Wow. That, that made quite a package. And you got proper wind wings here so you can get some real ventilation. That's the first air conditioning. Yeah. What that is. You have it on high now. Yeah, I got, I got, the, got it on high. Got the air conditioner on high. Well, didn't Hudson have the weather eye? Was that Hudson or was that? Uh, no, that part was, of Nash, I believe. Nash had the weather eye. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Which Hudson became part of in right. 1955. Right. So they probably had the weather eye in the 55, 6, and 7s. Yeah. yeah. The only car company to use the word fabulous. Fabulous. I didn't realize that was a factory. I thought that was, you know, a racer had put that on. The there. factory wanted that on their cars, and I don't know who. Who, who that was. It might have been Vince Piggins came yeah. up with that. And it just makes me smile. Bill on Hudson Twin H Power. Here it is. Root torque. Yeah. Now, Dave, I always knew you were a legendary machinist and engine builder, but thanks for being a great historian, too. You know, you got to write a book. you got to write these stories down okay. because they're fascinating, you know, and when we go, there's nobody to pass them on. Well, thanks for having me, Jay. It's been a wonderful time, and I'm glad you enjoyed the car. Well, no, and, and thanks for being a real car guy. You we betcha. appreciate it. You betcha. Thank Keeping you. the Hudson Hornet alive. The fabulous Hudson the Hornet. The fabulous Hudson Hornet. See you guys next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>